Yeah, that's not the picture you expect, is it? <laughs> well, a bit earlier this year, I think it was during the Easter break, um, we went to uh, Monkey World over in Dorset, Devon, how far is it? It's still in Dorset, we didn't go as far as Devon. The, it's places beginning with a D, they all seem the same to me. Like Hampshire, Hollywood. <laughs> anyway, we went to Monkey World, and it was quite nice, and uh, there were these really cute ones that are called woolly monkeys, that's one of them. And I mean, it's what it says on the tin, isn't it, a woolly monkey? And uh, we happened to be one, at one of the enclosures when one of the keepers brought them some strawberries and kind of tossed the strawberries in. And of course they all <clears throat> rushed up and grabbed the strawberries and they were happily munching away. Except for one of them, who kind of kept sitting apart and would only kind of sneak up and try and grab one when the others weren't looking or sometimes had to take one that the others had discarded. So I asked the keeper about this, being curious, and she explained that that's the youngest female and she hasn't had any babies yet. So she's at the lowest rung of the family hierarchy. So she just has to wait till everybody else has had their share. Which, well, that's how the animal kingdom often works. You have these hierarchies. And the thing is, in the human world, we have very much the same thing. People and societies, and sometimes churches as well, have their hierarchies, the social pecking orders, the ins and the outs. And we see that in this passage as well. There's the two main characters, if you like, well, two of the main characters, in a way, that we've come across, they couldn't be more different in this respect. Because first we have Jairus, a synagogue leader, very much one of the insiders, important, influential, respected in society. So yeah, very much one of the ins who would get the strawberries first, if you like. And then we have this woman with a permanent period constant flow of blood. So she was definitely one of the outsiders, anything but respected. She would have been sitting far away from the others. Because in Old Testament law and in most societies back then, women were considered unclean while they were having the period. And this woman having a permanent bleeding, hemorrhaging, was permanently unclean. She couldn't touch anyone. She couldn't worship at the temple. She couldn't get married, far too much of a social stigma. So um, she was very much an outsider. And I realized when I was looking at this passage that we often think of her as being old, but there isn't really any biblical reason to think of her as being old. It doesn't say that. Because it's quite possible that this hemorrhaging started when she was a teenager, kind of straight from pu puberty, in which case she is now in her mid or late twenties, so she isn't actually, or most likely not an old woman, she's quite young. Now I said these were the two main characters, now Jesus is obviously the main character, you would be surprised if I said anything else. Jesus has been on the other side of the lake, on the Gentile side, and he's now coming back home to Capernaum because for most of his earthly ministry, he did have a base in Capernaum, whether it was Peter's house, which is quite likely, or some other hired accommodation. Again, we can't be sure, but we know Peter lived there, so it's quite likely that Peter's house was his base. So he was coming back home to Capernaum, and the crowds were welcoming him, no surprise there at least. And then Jairus comes up to him with this plea for his only daughter, 12 years old, incidentally about the same time span that this woman has been hemorrhaging, but she's only 12 and she's dying. So he's obviously desperate, as anyone would be in that situation, but what we sometimes miss in this kind of context is how brave he is. Because Jesus was not popular with synagogue authorities and the religious leaders, we know that. He could get serious flack from his peers for kind of actually approaching Jesus with a plea for help. That's not what he should be doing. But 
It was a dire need and his desperation overcame the peer pressure and that is, makes him a very good example that he was prepared to go to Jesus and ask for help even if others would not approve. That is a very good example for us as well. But I did wonder sort of why was he prepared to do this? Why was he prepared to overcome the peer pressure that he would have felt from other synagogue rulers and Pharisees especially? Was it his wife that pleaded with him maybe? Or was it the dying girl herself who kind of had more of a childlike faith and thought, well come on dad, you know that Jesus could do something. Possible. But then I remember the passage that I preached about earlier this year in Luke chapter 4. Where Jesus casts out a demon in the synagogue in Capernaum, which is where Jairus was the synagogue leader. So, in all likelihood, Jairus would have been there when Jesus cast this demon out of the demonized man. He would have seen this liberation. He would have seen in person Jesus' power. That is probably why he was prepared to overcome his what reluctance to speak to this um, strange new rabbi that didn't abide, ab abide by any of the proper rules. He would probably have heard other stories of healings as well in the area, but he was there in person when something really dramatic happened. Well, we never know the whole back. Well, we might find out the whole backstory once we meet them, but um, until eternity comes. It remains slightly speculative, but I think it makes very much sense. Jairus was there when Jesus cast out the demon. In any case, Jesus hears his plea and agrees to come with him to come and heal the girl. And of course, the crowd follows him <coughs> as well. We kind of forget that most of the time, unless Jesus specifically withdraws, there would have been quite a lot of people surrounding him. Because, I mean, you'd have a lot of kids, they would have been running around, and obviously kids being curious, they would always want to be where the action was and kind of find out what's happening. There would have been women in the crowd, there would have been fishermen, I mean, Peter and James and John's comrades, companions, uh, colleagues is what I'm looking for really. Probably the old scribe or Pharisee there to check out on Jesus and see what's, what is he doing now. There would have been a lot of pushing and jostling and kind of shoving and, well, you know what the crowd can be like. Just imagine Black Friday at West Key. Something like that. So nobody, it seems, nobody notices that one woman who really should not have been there. Why shouldn't she have been there? Well, because she was unclean and every person she touched in that crowd would become religiously unclean. And that is a very big responsibility to take on yourself. You're kind of going in there and risking the wrath of the whole crowd. Because ritual purity was very important. You couldn't worship in the temple if you were unclean. <coughs> ritual purity was part and parcel of, of life back then. And she would have been well aware that she was violating the rules of good behaviour. She should just have stayed away from everybody. But again, her desperation was stronger than society's pressure on her. And at this stage, she's been suffering for 12 years, Jesus is clearly her final hope. It has to be, she has to get to him, come what may. So she again takes this risk just like Jairus did, but from a completely different end of, of his society's hierarchy, if you like. So, this woman gets there and she reaches out and she touches the edge of Jesus' cloak, which is not the hem at the bottom, which we might think when it says edge, it's a, the tassels, the dangling fringes of the prayer shawl, which every Jewish man would have been wearing, which symbolized adherence to the law of Moses. And uh, I think Jenny pointed out in a sermon a while back that there is a possible connection here with the phrase in Malachi, which we sing in a Christmas carol, risen with healing in his wings, because the word wing 
is connected to, through Greek and Hebrew, to the words for the tassels. Luke doesn't make anything of that. He doesn't, he doesn't explicitly make that connection, but it's possible. But I don't think this woman needed that verse to realise that Jesus would probably be able to heal her, because, as we've seen, he had performed a lot of healings already. But that is the bit you, of his prayer shawl that she touches, which is kind of ironic in a way, because the prayer tassels symbolise adherence to the law of Moses, and she's deliberately violating the purity regulations of that law. And, as usual, that doesn't seem to bother Jesus very much, because he sees the human before he sees the law. The intention of all these holiness rules in the law of Moses was to explain to humanity, through Israel, about sin and holiness and purity, how to approach a holy God. And humanity needed this guidance. We need to understand that sin is bad and God is holy and there is a barrier in between. So that's what the law is talking about, how sinners can approach God. But then Jesus comes. And in Jesus, God, this holy God, has stepped down himself into the impurity and mess that is human life. And that is a situation that the law did not address. The law wasn't talking about God approaching human beings. There were hints in the prophets that that was going to happen, but that is not what the law is talking about. So Jesus, in violating the law, if you like, wasn't really violating the purpose of the law. He was introducing a completely new aspect. God coming to sinful human beings. <laughs> And we see this over and over again in the Gospels, how Jesus interacts with the religiously unclean. He's come to make them clean. The lepers, the prostitutes, the Gentiles and Samaritans, the tax collectors, this hemorrhaging woman. Jesus constantly finds these people that everybody else would have been shunning. But, whereas normally that kind of interaction would make the pure impure, Jesus, the Son of God, can't be contaminated by any form of impurity. It's impossible. The Son of God cannot become impure. So instead, His holiness, His purity, contaminates the impure. It turns the whole thing upside down. Normally, in human interactions, the impure contaminates the pure. It's the impurity that spreads. When Jesus comes, he turns it upside down and the purity starts spreading from him into all these otherwise impure people. And we don't really live in a society that thinks that much about purity and impurity, so we don't really get the impact of this. But it's incredibly significant. God turns it upside down and God's purity starts spreading. And we see that with Jesus, when he meets sinners, they are forgiven and given a new chance. When he meets the sick, they're healed. And as we should see soon, when he meets the dead, they're raised to life again. Because all those things that are breaking down humanity are reversed when Jesus comes along. And the impure are made pure. So when this broken woman touches Jesus, power flows out from him to make her whole, purifying her and healing her which is an amazing miracle. And then she tries to sneak away, unnoticed. So we just say, okay, something's happened, I better leave now before anybody notices me. Very human reaction in a way. But Jesus makes it very clear that that's not going to happen. So he kind of first points out he's felt this healing power going out from him. He noticed that this happened. And then he calls her back. So, of course, she does then come back, she tells the story, and she's probably fearing a terrible telling off, because that's what she would have got from any other rabbi. But instead, Jesus commends her faith and sends her off in peace. And it's kind of interesting that she's the only person in the Gospels that Jesus addresses as daughter, which again suggests that she's younger than him, because he wouldn't say daughter to an older woman. 
And if he's sort of in his early 30s, she's obviously younger. That's incidental in a way. But it's more interesting to look at why did he feel the need to call her back? Why didn't he just let her go and return back home and rejoice in her healing? Well, I think there were three reasons actually. For one thing, he needed to reassure her that he wasn't cross with her, she'd done the right thing in coming to him. And in John's Gospel he tells us that anyone who comes to him will be welcomed. He's not going to turn away anyone who comes to him. He will receive anyone who wants to be with him. And I think that again is quite an important part of the, of the Gospel message. So he calls her back to kind of reassure her, yes, it's fine, you did the right thing. I think it was also to make it clear to the crowds that she had been properly healed, because otherwise, if she'd just gone back home, nobody would have known, mm -hmm. and they would have continued to shun her, she would still have been an outcast. In order for her to be restored to full involvement in society, maybe even getting married, the healing had to be made public. And I think also for her own sake, because you know what we're like as humans. We may be fully convinced about something one day and then start doubting it again the next day. And if she'd been healed, she would probably start having regular periods. And you can imagine she's been had this bleeding for 12 years. It stops. If she then starts having a period again, that could really make her worry. Oh no, it didn't work. It only lasted for a bit and now it's come back again. So Jesus had to make it clear that no, you have been properly healed. So she would have that assurance when her body returned to its, its normal function. So it was actually quite important for Jesus not just to let this power go out to heal her, but to speak to her and reassure her. And I think that's part of the beauty of this whole passage here. Because it shows just how thorough Jesus' is compassion is. He doesn't just provide the healing. It's not like a, a conveyor belt. Okay, here comes a kind of sick person. Heal, okay, off you go. Heal, off you go. Next, heal, off you go. Next, heal, off you go. He looks at the person. He sees the person and he sees what this person needs. Jesus cares about the person, not just the illness or the sin that may characterize that person. He sees beyond that which is why he had to make it public. You may have noticed that he didn't do that with Jairus' daughter. On the contrary, he tells him not to tell anybody. Well, her death and her resurrection would not affect her, their social standing, and there was no need to kind of make it public, because very soon everybody would see that this, this girl who had been declared dead was alive again. There was no need to make, make anything of it, as it were. And maybe the reason he tells them not to tell anyone is that he doesn't want people to start bringing corpses to him on a regular basis. Again, different situation, different modus operandi. Now, Jesus still has power to heal. That is also an important thing to take away from this. It wasn't just something that happened back then. And we do sometimes see supernatural interventions. And I think some churches are very good at praying for healings, sometimes a bit overzealous in declaring healings when they haven't actually happened. And as a consequence, some of us are very reluctant to pray for healings because we don't want to get anybody's hopes up and then nothing happens. I think we should pray for healings and expect healings more often than maybe we in our particular tradition do. I think that it is an important part of proclaiming the kingdom. But I also think that we mustn't forget that Jesus' main ministry, while this world lasts, wasn't healing illness and raising the dead, but redeeming sinners and proclaiming his kingdom. And when the kingdom comes in power, we sang about it in one of the songs where Jesus is coming back, when Jesus comes back and the kingdom is established in full power and glory, well then all sickness will be healed. Death itself will die. This is such an important part of the Gospel as well. But until that day, healings are signposts. If somebody is healed, it is to remind us that this day is coming. Jesus has triumphed. But the 
main thing is to keep proclaiming the gospel, whether or not people are healed. The gospel of the kingdom, where God offers forgiveness, where God offers reservation, and where one day sin and death and disease will be overcome. Humans are very good at judging each other, and we build these hierarchies just like those monkeys and like most animals, and we differentiate between the insiders and the outsiders. And Jesus shows us very clearly that he doesn't. He had no time for society hierarchies because everybody matters to Jesus. <clears throat> everybody matters. And we see that in this passage. The two recipients of his power here were the lowest of the low on society's scale. A hemorrhaging woman and a dead girl. Or impure, childless females. It can't get much worse than that. Or could it back then anyway. But Jesus wasn't having any of that. He saw them as people, acknowledged them, took a personal interest in them and their needs, and met their needs. Now that is about as countercultural as you could be back then. And again, fortunately, our society doesn't judge women in quite, in quite the same way. But we do still judge each other, and there are still hierarchies, and there are still value judgments that we make about each other for various reasons. But as children of God, as disciples of Jesus, we should try not to. Because Jesus sees everybody as an individual, a human being created in the image of God. Jesus takes a personal interest in each and every one of us. And in the kingdom of God, everybody is equal. You're familiar with that New Testament division between Jews and Gentiles? You looked down on each other and both felt that they were better. In the kingdom of God, that distinction is gone. And looking at society today, we have the division between the permanently fixed and the refugees, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, educated and uneducated, all sorts of divisions that we Kind of emphasize in various ways. But everybody matters to Jesus. The weak and the strong, the lowly and the respectable, the ones who run the world and the ones whose society doesn't really care too much about, they all matter to Jesus. So if you meet somebody who seems to be treated as if they're totally insignificant, share a bit of the love of Jesus with them. And if you feel insignificant in your situation, or whatever, because of circumstances or whatever. If you feel insignificant, remember that Jesus invested time and power in these two young women who nobody else would have cared that much about. And he cares just as much about you. Now we do have to ask. Most miracles happen when we ask for them. We need faith to take that risk and go to Jesus, like Jairus, like the hemorrhaging woman. They can teach us a bit about faith. I mean, they obviously believe Jesus could help them. That's kind of the first step. You're not going to ask Jesus for help if you don't believe he can. That's just a basic level. I think what we see here is another aspect of faith. I've already emphasized this, but coming back to it, putting the need for Jesus above all other considerations. The hemorrhaging woman, she disregards the societal pressure to hide away, and Jairus ignores the peer pressure to avoid Jesus. It's always worth ignoring everything that wants to keep you away from Jesus. Bear that in mind. Don't let anything or anyone keep you from following Jesus, from talking to Jesus and talking about Jesus. Because it all boils down to him. Jesus died so that everyone who asks can receive forgiveness and restoration. He rose again so that everyone who believes can have eternal life and fellowship with him forever. And he will receive everyone who comes to him. And he will share the comfort and compassion of the kingdom with anyone who asks. Because his mercy, his compassion, his love is not based on our human value judgments. It's based on God's unconditional love for every human being created in his image. That is the gospel. Let's pray.